Jennifer, how do you like that? I'm her favourite, not you. All right, baptisms are so good and uh, just uh, always find it an encouragement, really do. All right, well, we're talking about insecurity today. I'm going to roll straight into it. Um, insecurity can come from all sorts of different places. Sometimes you don't even know, right? Now, I don't know why I feel so insecure at the moment, but I'm just struggling with that. Sometimes it can come through things that we do, mistakes that we make ourselves. Sometimes insecurity comes through things that have got nothing to do with us or hardly anything to do with us and uh, all sorts of different ways and I guess for me I want to share a story from my life where I had to battle a bit of insecurity a thing that I went through a thing that happened to me um, forgive me if you've heard this before I have shared it some time ago but it was a circumstance that happened about 10 years ago for me I was invited to speak at a conference and it was a youth leaders conference. Now, I had spoken on one or two things a little bit like that before, but for me, it was a bit of a, uh, a nerve-wracking time. I prepared really hard, and I said, oh, I'll do it. And uh, I don't know what you would think about that if you were asked to speak. It's something that, for most of us, that's a, that's a fairly stretching experience. Well, I found out that a number of things conspired against me as I went to speak at this conference. Here's some of the things that happened. First of all, it was on a Saturday night. Now, I told, you guys will remember Pastor Trevor Chandler, a very experienced um, minister of the gospel, preached for 40 years. I told him this story. He said, oh, I never speak on a Saturday night. So there you go. There's lesson number one. If you ever ask, don't speak on a Saturday night. It was after dinner. They'd all been sitting in their groups and they'd had dinner in the same auditorium so they were full they also had announcements things were running late and eventually i got on at about 8 30 to speak my message i found out later on that most of the people in this conference had flown in that morning and had most of them had been up since about 4 a.m and then they'd sat in session after session after session can anybody else see what's about to happen here for me? And to make it worse, sitting in the front row right in front of me was a speaker from America, a legend of the faith in youth circles, and he'd been speaking all day. But now we're going to invite Carl from Ipswich, who's going to come up. And he's going to speak to you tonight, all right? I think I was about two minutes into that message, maybe two minutes, 30 seconds, when I realised that the ship was sinking. <laughs> Has anybody else had one of those experiences before? Where some, the, the little voice inside of my head is going, run, run away, get out of this place, you know? I mean, it was, it was, it was unbelievable how quickly people just gave over to that desire to fall asleep. I'll tell you something, it's normal, it's normal for people to fall asleep when you speak. Somebody's going to fall asleep here this morning. That's normal. Doesn't matter how good a speaker you are, you are, that happens. But I'm telling you, two and a half minutes in, some people just fully gave up. They just fully just put their arm on there, you know, and just fell asleep. People are falling asleep everywhere. And to make it worse, the, the guy that had invited me, the friend that I had, who was my connection, well, he's not falling asleep. He's sitting right in front of me, but he's basically trying to hold his eyes open, right? I mean, every time I look at him, he's like nodding off and he's like trying to remain attentive to me. And even worse, the guy that I am, you know, the, the, the famous speaker who I've been introduced to like 10 minutes before the session, he's the only one awake in the whole place. I would have rather he fell asleep, to be honest. And he's looking at me with that look in his eyes going, I know that you know the ship is sinking, you know? He's just got this sort of smile on his face. And to top it all off, there is a pillar in this place, a little bit like there is down the back here, and there's a table sitting down the back. And I kid you not, that table's not falling asleep, but this is why not. They're playing some sort of a game on that table down the back there. So people are falling asleep. I've left my notes, I'm trying to be funny and charismatic and trying to re I'm using every trick I know nothing's working and at every quiet moment when I'm trying to be serious 
that table's laughing at something that is going on over there on the Monopoly board. Maybe somebody went to jail or something like that. I don't know. But they're laughing. Can anybody else in this place sense what is going on inside of me at this moment? Like the absolute train wreck of a night that is. And I'm telling you, as the night fit, I mean, somehow I got through that whole thing. I couldn't run to my car quick enough. I couldn't sat and have it back to Ipswich quick enough. And I don't know about you, but sometimes this is what happens in life, that experiences happen, things happen to us when we battle. For me, for months after that, every time somebody would say, you know, I, I, I was speaking in this church at that time, and you speak, that same voice is like, man, are you, are you serious? Do you think you can do that again? Uh, you, I can't, you need to run a team meeting. That vo same voice is like, man, you don't have what it is takes to be able to push through, be able to do that thing. It was a, a serious battle of insecurity. Now again, sometimes it happens through experiences like that. Some of you here today will talk about far worse experiences that have happened to you in life that have sapped the courage out of you. Some of you don't even know where these things come from, but you recognise that there's insecurity. And we're going to have a look at somebody in the scripture, bless his heart, that uh, didn't leave us with a whole lot of life lessons, but he, he, he shows us how not to work through ultimately insecurity, and that is Saul, King Saul. So we're going to read from the scripture this morning, 1 Samuel 10, verse 20. It says, when Samuel, uh, the background to this, by the way, Saul's already been confirmed as king. So Samuel's already told him, anointed him. This is happening, and Saul knows this, but they're at this sort of final stage, the big day. And they're going to confirm it by casting lots. So when Samuel had all Israel come forward by tribes, the tribe of Benjamin was taken by lot. Then he brought forward the tribe, uh, sorry, then he brought forward the tribe of Benjamin, clan by clan, and uh, Matri's clan was taken. Finally, Saul, son of Kish, was taken. But when they looked for him, he was not to be found. So they inquired of the Lord further. Has the man come here yet? And the Lord said, yes, he has hidden himself among the supplies. They ran and brought him out. And as he stood among the people, he was a head taller than any of the others. Samuel said to all the people, do you see the man that the Lord has chosen? There is none like him among all the people. And the people shouted, long live the king. Honestly, this story is an incredible story of a guy who in his moment of glory misses his chance to grab a hold of his destiny because of insecurity. You think about what's happening here. This is the big day. Everybody's dressed up. Everybody's expecting the new king. The trumpets are blaring. The final lot is taken. Where's Saul? And where is Saul? He's hiding. What does it say? Among the supplies, the ESV version says he's hiding among the baggage. Why is he out among the baggage? What is he doing out there? You might sort of have all sorts of ideas. Some people have wondered, oh, maybe he was being modest. Maybe he was just like, well, I don't want to be too presumptive in this moment. I don't think so at all because we see this pattern continue over and over and over again in the life of Saul of letting insecurity take over his life in a moment when it shouldn't be. So we're going to learn this morning some things about insecurity. And there's three things I want to talk about. And if you're wondering this morning, I don't know, do I battle with insecurity or not? Have a look at these things before we beat up and saw too much. Have a look at these things and apply them to your own life and say yeah or no. But are these things that point to me that yeah, I might battle with insecurity in my life? What do we learn from Saul? in this situation. Here's the first thing that we learn. Insecurity distorts reality. Insecurity distorts reality. You know, what is so amazing about this guy Saul is that he was right in every sense of the word. It's a funny thing in scripture when kings are chosen. If you read your Bible, you'll know that normally it, God seems to take pleasure in choosing the guy nobody expects, except in this case. This is the first king they're choosing. And he's right in every sense of the word. He's tall, he's Apparently good looking, he's already been chosen by uh, Samuel. He knows that he's been chosen. God wants to anoint him for the role. 
And even when he's hiding in that moment of glory, when it's this moment, God even points out there my prophetic word, ha, he's over there and he's with the baggage. Everything is right. All the truth, all the facts line up and point to Saul being able to grab a hold of his destiny, except Saul won't do it. Saul doesn't believe the truth that he sees around him because insecurity distorts what is true in his life. I don't know if you've ever had that perception about yourself where you've understood that, you know what, things are lighting up. We think about it as parents. We often have to do this with our kids. How many of us as parents who grab our children and in a moment of insecurity, our child is like, has to go out to bat and cricket for the first time or play netball or do an exam. And as a parent, you're saying, listen, this is done it work. work. You've practiced. No one's going to be bothered even if you don't succeed. It's okay. You can do it. But this little kid in that moment is like, all the truth doesn't matter one little bit because of the insecurity that's rising up. Now, don't think for a second that's not what it's like for us as adults, as, as big people. We have exactly the same thing. Somebody says to us, you've got to go for that job. You, you're going to nail that job. You are the right person for that job. And you look at the facts, and they might be true, but insecurity says, no way. Those facts aren't true. That's not possible for you. You can take this role. You can do this ministry. You're the right person for the, for the job. But insecurity says, I'm not going to look at the truth that I see around me. But I'm going to let that be distorted by insecurity. Maybe that's you. You can look at your life and say, yeah, I've done that. What else? Insecurity causes us to fear the wrong things. You know, King Saul, as you look at the history of his life, constantly afraid of the wrong things. Let me just read you some of the things that he was afraid of. He's afraid of his calling as a king. We've just seen that. He's afraid of the Philistine hordes in 1 Samuel 13. Now, you might think, well, that's okay. No, he, he's got the God of the angel armies on his side, but he's afraid. He's afraid of his own army in 1524. He's afraid of Goliath in 1711. He's afraid of David in 18, 12, and 15, and 19. He's afraid that there's going to be a coup in 22, 7. And he's even afraid of the prophecies that are said about him in 28, 20. You know, by the way, in contrast, David is afraid essentially of one thing, and that is God. David's feared God. But insecurity causes us to see everything as a, as a threat. The other thing about insecurity is it causes us to see our allies as a threat. The, the very people that are on our side, suddenly we start looking at them as a threat. Saul saw David as a threat. Can you believe that? David, a man after God's own heart. David, who had risked his life to defeat God. David, who had won battle after battle for Saul. David, who had pledged his allegiance to Saul and Israel. David, and Saul sees David as a threat. In your life, who do you see as a threat that probably is your greatest ally? Who is it that when they walk in the room, they say something? Oh, why did they say that? What did they mean by that, really? Why did that friend of mine just walk past me? Why haven't they texted back quicker than I would have expected? Because we see the wrong things as a threat, and that's insecurity. We start to fear things that are not there and our mind starts to play tricks on us. Do you see things as a threat? Insecurity causes you to do the insignificant. That's the other thing we find about insecurity. It causes you to do the insignificant. I love the King James Version of this word supplies or baggage. It doesn't go with any of them. It just says the stuff. Where's Saul? Oh, he's with the stuff. I almost love the, the picture of that. The translators are like, we couldn't even be bothered with that word. Identifying it. We're just saying the stuff. He's just out with the boring stuff. He's doing the insig insignificant. What was he doing out with the baggage? Anybody ever wanted that? Is he cataloging it? Is he putting it in order? Is he protecting it? Is he repairing it? I don't know what he's doing, but I tell you, he's doing what he's not meant to be doing. In that moment, he's meant to be a king. He's meant to be stepping up. He's meant to receive his mantle as a king. That's what he's meant to be doing. But insecurity 
caused him to stay out there and hide. Friends, that's what insecurity will do to your life. I'll tell you something, the baggage, the supplies, the stuff, it's safer there. There's no hassles there, not a whole lot to fear there. No one's going to bother Saul there if he had stayed there. Wouldn't have had the issues in his life, but he would never have reached his destiny. He ultimately doesn't because of insecurity. But we will never reach our destiny in our life if we allow ourselves to remain with the baggage, with the stuff, with the thing that God is calling you to. Now, that's not saying for a second that every single one of us is meant to be a king. I mean, sometimes we can read that. What's I've got to... I don't know, be a politician or lead some great organisation. I've got to be some sort of superstar. No, it does mean you've got to do the thing that God has asked you to do. That God has something significant and wonderful and awesome for you to do, but it's, it's what God has asked you to do, the part that God has asked you to play. There's a great story I read about an orchestra conductor from the 1800s. And I just showed people are the same all through the centuries. His name is Sir Michael Costa, and he's from England. And it was the night before the big rehearsal and uh, the big performance, and he actually had a choir come in, and he also had a uh, the orchestra there, and everybody's playing, doing their bit. Everybody's going on about it. And apparently, true story, the piccolo player. You guys know the piccolo, the small little flute-like thing. The piccolo player decides in his head, what? He has a big attack of insecurity. He decides, oh, I'm not that important. I'm not that special. No one really even notices if the piccolo doesn't play. So the piccolo player decides to stop playing, but he's going to pretend to play. So he sits there and just goes like this. No one notices anyway whether I play or not. And about 30 seconds into the piccolo player stopping playing, suddenly Sir Michael Potter stops the whole thing. Stops the whole chorus, everybody. And he asks the question, where's the piccolo player? What's going on? Why can't I hear the piccolo playing in this moment? You know what? We learned a great lesson out of that. Not everybody would have noticed that the piccolo wasn't playing, but Sir Michael Costa heard that the piccolo wasn't playing. And this is the truth in our life. You need to step up to the thing that God has asked you to do. You might think it's unimportant. You might think it's not as special. I don't know. But the truth is, your part to play is important. God is that orchestra conductor. God has asked every single one of us to step into the role that he's asked you to step into. So step into it. Play your part. And I'm telling you, even if nobody else notices, nobody else sees God himself, sees. So there's three little signs there of insecurity. Maybe you recognize yourself in one of them. Do you let insecurity distort your reality? Does it cause you to fear the wrong things? Uh, does it cause you to miss your destiny? Are you someone hanging back with the baggage, with the supplies? What I'm really trying to say here is it's worth facing in our life. It's worth facing in our life if we're struggling with insecurity. It's this thing will hold you back. So what do we learn from this passage of scripture? I think we learn some important things. Really the heart of this is point, it's one point, is it safe? It's God that places the crown on our head. You know what? You could go to the self-help section, find I in the library and pull out a book on insecurity. And now you would get some good advice in that book. I'm not really arguing that. You could flip the pages, you'd probably find in some form the first three points that I've already said. That the, the dangers, the worries, the problems with insecurity. But I'll tell you something, this is where Christianity differs from the world's advice right here at this moment. What are you going to do about it? Because the world will say some variation of this, and look, there's some power in this truth. It just doesn't go far enough. But the world will say, find the inner resources that are inside yourself. Believe in yourself. You are strong enough. You are a man, you're a woman, you're a conqueror. Believe in yourself. The trouble with that advice is two things. The first one is sometimes we just know we're too weak to be able to keep that going. We give it a go, we give it a shot for a little while, and we just don't crack it. It's not strong enough to believe in ourselves. Here's the other thing, sometimes we overstep. Then we just 
give ourselves the self-belief. We, we, we are. We are it. We are beyond it. And pride starts to find its way into our life. And both of them are equally damaging in their own way. Christianity, our faith, tells us something totally different. It's your value, your worth, that crown was placed on you by somebody else. But God places that crown on your head. That's the truth that Saul should have taken into himself. He was aware of his failings, of his weaknesses, of his difficulties. But at the end of the day, who placed the crown on his head? Who called him out? Who asked him to do this role? And that's the truth that we've got to grab a hold of in our life. And you might say, well, that's great. For Saul, he had a crown put on his head. Here's just some modern day examples you can grab from the scripture. Apply to yourself. Jesus, thousands of years later, tells the story of the prodigal son. And you know that story. The prodigal son comes from the pigs. He comes in dirty and messed up. The prodigal son has a major insecurity issue. I mean, he finds his way back to the farm, but he essentially says, just be a servant. I'm, I'm not worthy. I'm nothing. Just, just let me work. And through no strength of himself, what does the father do? It's a robe. He didn't own that robe. He puts that robe on him. It's just like a crown. He puts a ring on his finger. He puts sandals on his feet. He says, I know that you see who you are, that this is what I place on you. Let's keep going with this. Jesus is what we're clothed with. Galatians tells us in 3.27, we're clothed with none other than Jesus Christ. That's what we're clothed with. Let's have a listen to Romans 8.15. The spirit you receive does not make you a slave so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought your adoption to sonship. And we cry, Abba, Father. So that means I something special. In it. I don't know if you see the beauty of that, the freedom in that. That means our security is no longer based on the things that I've got, my inner strength, whether I am a good conference speaker or not, whether I am a brilliant teacher or not, or trading or professional, whether my business is going great guns or my marriage is struggling, whether my kids love me or not. I am loved by the Father. I am a son or a daughter of Christ. And I receive that outside of myself. You have a crown on your head put there by the Father. And that's the truth that we've got to grab a hold of. Now maybe, again, you've been around here long enough, plenty of churches, you've heard this sort of message before. Do you understand what you've got? Who you are. I think sometimes we grab a hold of this, but at the wrong end, we start to believe, all right, my, I've got to grab a hold of my destiny. I've got to, I've got to believe in oh, what Jesus believes in me. How about you just start here? Just get the revelation of Jesus Christ himself. Just concentrate on that. Here's one more story on this, Matthew 16, 18 to 19. This is a famous story where Peter comes to Jesus and Jesus asks, the disciples, who do you say that I am? And of course, what does Peter say? Peter says, uh, you are the Christ. This is Peter's moment in the sun. You are the Christ. You are the son of the living God. And Jesus is like wrapped with this answer. Why? Because Peter gets a revelation of who he is. And of course, Jesus says, well, on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of Hell will not prevail against it. Now, just know something here. I don't believe when Jesus says, on this rock, I will build my church. He's talking about Peter himself. He's talking about the revelation that Peter got. What revelation did Peter get? Who Jesus was. That he is the Christ. That he is the Messiah. That he is the one that came, that saves, that causes us to live again. But sometimes what we miss in this whole thing is that Peter got a revelation, great, but what does Jesus say immediately after that revelation? And he says, you are Peter. And then he goes on and he says, man, you, Peter, you're going to do great things. Peter, you're going to be a part of building the church, the, the greatest organization on the face of the planet. Peter, you're going to lead the charge in that because you are Peter. But how did Peter get to have that revelation? 
because he had a revelation of who Christ was. See, our revelation of our destiny comes from the revelation of who Christ is. If you're ever doubting your destiny, who you are, where you're meant to be, I tell you, don't concentrate on believing in your destiny. Concentrate on believing who Christ is. Just go back to that. Go back to the truth of who Christ is in your life. And the beauty of that is, you'll get your destiny. You'll say, you are Lauren. You are Greg. You are Sue. And this is my destiny for you. And the beautiful thing is, and you don't go beyond. Because it's like, well, what's your destiny for me? What do you want me to do? I don't have to go beyond that. It's not based on all the things that I see. I know where my security comes from and I'm going to take a hold of the destiny that you've got. So how do we respond? Just three quick thoughts. First one is this, that we find ourselves. We find ourselves. It sounds very ethereal, right? Like very new age. Find yourself. I'll take it a step further. Play a game of hide and seek with yourself. Everybody feel in with the mode now? What am I talking about there? I actually think that we're not particularly good at being self-aware in modern day people. And really what I'm saying to you, I want you to do a bit of an audit of your life and, and ask yourself, do I see insecurity in my life? Now I have a think of some of those things that I just talked about. Do you find yourself doing that insignificant? Only you can answer that. But are you stuck back there really doing the stuff that you know God's calling you to something else? Are you distorting reality all the time? Are people saying, man, I see this, and I see this, and I see this. And you're like, I, I don't see any of that. Or are you fearing the wrong things all the time? Just constantly afraid of this or that. These things creeping up in your life. Do a bit of self-evaluation. Do a little bit of searching in your own life. Now sometimes, I will say, it's helpful to get somebody else to speak into that spot because we can't do it. We're blind to ourselves. That is where a counsellor is so helpful. A good friend, a mentor. Someone else can say, what do you see in my life? But I'm telling you, you need to see it. You need to own it when you see it. The thing about Saul is, I find it really interesting. God doesn't give him a pass mark because Saul's got insecurity in his life. I mean, Saul's got massive issues in his life, but God is out. So I, I see that you're struggling with insecurity. I'm not going to really worry too much. Just do your best as king. Mess things up. No big deal. No, ultimately, we, saw, we see that this, this insecurity in his life wrecks his destiny. Takes Israel the wrong direction. He goes on murderous, murderous rampages. He, he meddles with witchcraft. And ultimately, he dies on a battlefield with his son, who he should have handed over his legacy to, his kingdom to. That's what should have happened. But he messes it up. And friends, listen, God is patient. As you read the story of Saul, you see God constantly giving him opportunities, chances to turn it around. But at the end of the day, he misses his destiny and it affects the generations to come. We cannot be people that just constantly don't be aware of the own the insecurity that is in our own life. We must grab a hold of it. We must recognize it. We must own it. And say, that's what it is. That belongs to me. I see insecurity. You know the beautiful thing about that is when you start to see it, you start to recognize it, you can name it when you see it. Jess would be my witness. Sometimes I'll use this phrase, Jess, I think it's probably my insecurity. You start to get clear and you can have a discussion with a good friend. Probably my insecurity, but what do you think about this? And just wrestling with this one. Have a conversation. Say it to yourself. Sometimes that voice, that little whisper, it'll come up in different ways, if we're honest. Sometimes you won't recognise it for a few days. I don't know if anywhere else has you put your hand up, but experience that. But it's a few days later, you hang on. I know what that voice is. I know what that whisper is. You sounded a bit different today, but I know who you are. You're insecure. And so we own it. What is the gospel? The gospel is we are more sinful and flawed than we ever dared believe. That's the first part, owning it. The second part is we are more loved and accepted than we ever dared hope. The power 
to accept ourselves come from the power of who we are in Christ, so we own it. What's the next step? Next step is that we change our mind. We're going to change our mind. Romans 12, 2 says we're transformed by the renewing of our mind. It's a really interesting word, that renewing. Renewing is like renovation. You have to go through a renovation. Who's just show hands? Who's ever done a renovation on your house? Just put your hand up and say, now keep your hand up. It's got to be more than that, but that's all right. Keep your hand up if you love the process of renovating your house. <laughs> Some hands have stayed up. That's not, that doesn't work with my, my point, to be honest. <laughs> Here's what I found about re- find out about renovation. Changing the way we think is this, when you start a renovation, you see the problem, right? We don't have enough space in the house. I hate how that door is like this, that window's ugly. You see the problem. This is true for us. As we renovate our mind, we have to identify, see the problem. But we start the process of renovation. We agree to it. And then when we're on that journey, you can't stop it. You've got to keep on going. Because here's what I found about renovations. Tradies tradies, right? <laughs> tradies, they don't show up on time, they leave dust all over your house, they overcharge. If you're sitting next to a tradie, just dig them in the ribs or something like that. <laughs> Am I right? But this is the, the, the process of renovation. It's messy. It's ugly. There's difficulties. Sometimes things look worse in the middle of it than they do before you started. But this is the point. As we walk the journey of changing our mind, changing our thinking, we've got to say, I'm starting. I own the issue in my life and I'm starting. And sometimes it's going to look messy. Sometimes I'm going to fail. Sometimes I'm going to feel like I'm back at the start again. But I know I'm headed in a direction where I'm changing my thinking. That's really what the renovation's about. It's changing my thinking. It's bathing myself in what does the Word of God say about me. It's why Jess said last week that the bones represent our structure, represent our strength, represent who we are in Christ. We've got to find every verse that we can that talks about our identity, who we are, that we're new creations in Christ, that we're sons and heirs, daughters of the King. We've got to speak that truth into our life. And when we see the mess there, we say, no, I'm changing, I'm on my way. And the final thing in all of this is, in the middle of this process, when you're failing and you're falling and It's not working and you feel like this thing's risen up again. You remember, I started the process and I am going to I'm walking to where God's leading me and it'll take time. In the middle of it, we see Christ. We come back to Christ. When you are in those moments of failure, then just come back to Christ. Come back to Christ. You know, in Luke 22, it talks about, it's not it talks about, Jesus speaks on the night that he's going to die. And repeats two phrases. This is the sort of passage in the scripture you want to just keep reading. He says, for you, twice, my body is broken for you. I'm going to shed my blood for you. When he says for you, he means for you. You sitting here, right? For you. That's who he died for. That's who he laid down his life for. That's you are the person that he sacrificed for so that you would have a future, so that you would not live in your insecurity, so that you would be unleashed from these things that hold us back. You know, I felt to say this even last night. I was just meditating on this. You know, as Jesus hung there on that cross, we find out that Jesus suffered. The greatest moment of desperation, insecurity that anybody has ever experienced on this earth. And why do we know that? Because it says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You wonder if God knows, if Jesus knows what it feels like to be alone, to not have the goods, to be rejected by men. Jesus went there. Jesus was forsaken. Jesus suffered the absolute utter anguish and despair so that we don't have to. So that we have a relationship with the Father. And friends, you want relationship with the Father. He's the only one that is going to 
accept you as you are. He's the only one that's going to have no conditions on the relationships and the affirmation that you're looking for. Here is the truth in life. You know, we're often in our life as we battle insecurity. We'll be looking for affirmation from those around us. And you know what? If you're blessed and you've got good people, they'll come close sometimes. They'll nearly reach the, the mark of the stuff that you want. But the trouble is you always want more. There's always a bar that you want. And I'll tell you the truth. No human is ever going to fully reach that level of affirmation. Speak into your soul like you're looking for, but one person will ask God the Father. And He calls you to come forward. He calls you to wrap His arms around you. He wants to speak that affirmation and love into His life. And the only way you get there is through the Son. So we run to Him. Friends, it's too hard. This, this life is too hard to do without the love of Jesus Christ with our access to the Father, with the Spirit of God speaking to us. It's too hard. So I guess the conclusion to all this today is where do you land? Are you over there in the baggage and stuff? Are you living in your insecurity or do you or are you willing to come forward? You know what? Maybe you're here today and you have never had that revelation of Christ, but today something is becoming real in you. It's like you can feel a love and an acceptance that's available with you. That is Jesus Christ. That is Jesus Christ calling you. And he's calling you out of the cold. He's calling you out of the, the distance. He's call, calling you out of, you know, the parties over here. And you've always felt like your life is over there, distant. The parties for the special people, only the special people reach their destiny. Well, he's calling you back into that thing. And the way there is the revelation of Jesus Christ. You don't have to have it all sorted. It's just a matter of saying, I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe it because of the words that are being said, but I believe it because I feel something in here calling me. That's the Spirit of God calling you. And I'm going to give you a chance in a moment to respond to that calling of the Spirit of God. Or maybe you're here today and you just know the depths of your heart. Insecurity has ruined my life for too long, called me away for too long. It's time to own it. I'll tell you something. God has never said no to somebody that's wanted to approach Him. God has never rejected somebody who said, I want to deal with these things. Might not be an easy journey. Might be some work to do on the, on the way. But He wants to work with you in your life. And give you a chance to respond as well. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can be unleashed from all of these things we've been talking about today. Insecurity, God, that we can be unleashed from that. We can walk into our destiny. God, a destiny that is in you. And today, Lord, I pray for those that have never come into that destiny with you. Or perhaps, God, those that are have been distant for way too long and knowing they've been out on the cold in their relationship with you. Lord, I pray for them. Lord, draw them to you. And just as every eye is closed here today, I'm going to give you that opportunity. If you know you've been distant from God, you know that you've been separate from God, but today you feel, have a revelation of Jesus Christ. You see Jesus Christ. But I'm just going to give you that opportunity to respond right now, just by giving me a wave. Just, it, it's your way of saying, Jesus, I want to come back to you. God the Father, I want to come out from the cold. If that's you here this morning, that's awesome. I see a hand. Is there anybody else who just wants to respond right now? I'm just going to give you a second. This is such a powerful moment. It does take some courage for you to respond and say, Jesus, I want to respond to you. I, I don't understand it all. But I want to respond to you. Is there anybody else that wants to respond here this morning? Amen. That person responded. Can you just pray in your heart this prayer, Lord Jesus? I want to come home. I want to come to God the Father. I, I recognize my sin. I recognize the baggage in my life. I recognize that I've been distant from you and I want relationship. And I ask forgiveness. I thank you for what you did on the cross. And I walk back to you. I ask you to lead my life. I ask you to lead me out of 
insecurity asks you to leave me out of, the things that are holding you back, the sin that has entangled me, and lead me on in life with you. Praise God. Praise God. And for everybody else here, I'm just going to give you a moment to respond. If you know that this message just spoke to your heart, you've been living in insecurity too long, you've been letting insecurity hold you back, can you just give me a wave as well? Just put your hand up and say, that's me. That's great. It's just a bold step, but it's just a way of saying, God, I'm going to respond to you. Lord, I pray for these people that have just responded in this moment. Lord Jesus, I pray for a revelation of Jesus Christ, the love that you have for them, that you died for them, that you shed their blood, your blood for them, that you broke your body for them. And Lord, let them have that fresh revelation, the courage and the conviction to walk out of that place of insecurity and walk into the destiny that you have. And Lord, I pray for all of us here because we'll all walk through this at times. God, give us that revelation of Jesus Christ. Let us see our destiny, God, because we see our identity in you. Don't let us be isolated any longer, but let us be unleashed, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we put our hands together? Somebody made a faith.